you, Ms. Lois. We're starting this morning uh, our last lesson uh, in our series on real Christianity. If you did not get one of our lesson sheets, they're back there. Brother Dries, won't you grab? If you need one, put your hand up. Dries will get one to you. Dries charge them five dollars. One dollar delivery fee. Four dollars for Pastor Rice's coffee fund. My wife, my wife has to pay double. Yeah, new one today. So if you didn't get it this morning, uh, make sure you get one of these. We're going to be starting uh, in a couple of weeks a brand new series, and I'll talk about that uh, next Sunday. Uh, we're not going to finish today. We're going to start this lesson today, uh, but I want you to uh, make sure everybody gets one of these uh, lesson sheets uh, today. Appreciate your uh, prayers. Uh, turn, turn there with me quickly to Philippians chapter 1. As you're turning to Philippians chapter 1, appreciate you praying uh, for me this evening. Of course, Brother Friesen is going to be preaching tonight here because I'm going to be uh, kicking off a uh, revival and missions conference for Pastor David Harness at Victory Baptist Church this evening. Uh, so be praying for that, if you will, as uh, my wife and I will be there uh, this evening. And also, I'm going to be preaching there for them on Tuesday night. And I appreciate your prayers there. Uh, look here at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 9, 10, and 11. And this I pray that your love may abound yet the more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. And let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we need your help today. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word Lord, I pray that as we open it, as we study it today, Lord, that we will be encouraged, Lord, that we would receive your truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us, uh, Lord, to obey your word. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to grow. And Lord, as we've spent, Lord, the better part of a year looking at real Christianity, and Lord, some wonderful truths, Lord, that have helped and impacted my life and my heart. And Lord, as we continue this morning looking at some principles, some points of growth, Lord, I pray you'd help us with that. Help us never to be satisfied with the status quo. Help us not to be satisfied, Lord, until we see you face to face. Lord, bless us, work in us and through us. God, help me. Lord, to teach you right your truth, in Jesus' precious name we pray and ask it all, amen. As we look here, we see some uh, teaching, some truth in these three verses uh, that we're going to spend some time learning about and looking at this morning and the next, at least next week, maybe next two weeks, depending on how quickly we get through this here. Uh, but we're going to look at growth points growth points, or the subtitle of the lesson here is How Faith in Jesus Grows Greater. How many of you have green thumbs? How many of you are good at growing plants, flowers, vegetables? Nobody. Uh, how many of you have black thumbs? You can kill stuff really well. Put your hand up. And uh, my, my wife does not have a green thumb. If it is green, it's moldy. Uh, no, she's, uh, she's not the greatest at growing things. She's getting better, though. Uh, she, she's almost, it's almost green. And uh, I know there are some people that uh, they, you can give them a healthy plant, and a week later, it's dead. How many of you are like that? You can kill something, you're good at it. Uh, there are some people that are good at cultivating and growing. Uh, I grew up uh, where we had a large garden. Uh, we did a lot of uh, growing. Uh, some things you grow doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Uh, some things there's not a whole lot of uh, work to do during the growing process. Uh, some things there's a lot of work to do. My grandfather uh, took an old hoe 
Uh, that hoe is probably, uh, I'm guessing if it was still around today, it'd be over 100 years old, I'm sure of that. And he took it out to the shop when I was just a boy of about eight years old. And he took it on his grinder out in the old tractor shed and uh, he ground the sides down and made it a little narrow hoe. And then he took a saw and he cut the end of the uh, hoe off and shortened it down. And uh, he rounded off the end of that old hoe handle uh, so it fit me as an eight or nine year old boy. And I used to go out in the garden with my grandfather and have to hoe the weeds around the plants. Now, we'd hoe the weeds because those weeds would take some of the nutrients that the plant needed. And we got a better crop that way. It takes a lot of tending, a lot of work to get a good harvest. Uh, farming, uh, one, of the, one of the toughest uh, jobs in our world today. Uh, I think off in the last several years uh, here in Alberta, uh, we've had some bad years for our farmers and the climate has not been compatible. The weather, it, it, it's been tough. A lot of our farmers uh, in our province are struggling, uh, really struggling financially, dealing with the, how difficult it's been. And farming, even at its best, is hard work. It's, it's hard to cultivate. It's hard to produce and get a good crop. We in our world, in our time today, we, we don't want to wait for a harvest. Uh, we, we don't want to grow something. I mean, we can just go to the grocery store, walk to the produce section, take the produce, put it in a plastic bag, walk up to the till, lay it there, hand them a piece of plastic, and walk out with the vegetables. I talked to Brother Ramon. We we're talking about fishing this summer. He told me, he said, yeah, he, he said, Pastor Rice, he said, I, I like to go fishing. Uh, where did you do your fishing? Superstore. Super uh, he goes fishing at Superstore. I remember Brother Mike Padua uh, years ago. I used to tease Brother Mike about how he couldn't catch a fish. Brother Mike in the Philippines used to be a fisherman. He caught fish. He never could catch a fish in Alberta. About eight years ago, I think it was, several folks uh, went together on holiday in B.C. Dexter, I think you were there for that, weren't you, the, when Brother Mike caught the Superstore fish? And uh, they were all fishing. Next thing I know, I get a picture, and there's Mike standing, holding a big salmon. Man, I was impressed. I'm like, congratulations. I can't believe you finally caught a fish. I found out later, somebody went to the grocery store, bought the fish, brought it out to take a picture so they could say he caught a fish. Now, a lot of us, that's the way we fish. That's the way we, we harvest our vegetables. We go to Superstore. We're, we're not going to wait. Uh, we're not going to wait forever for that. We want instant gratification. Amen. Now, that translates, sadly. We, we live in the microwave culture and have it now. My grandmother made a lot of uh, soup beans, dry beans, when I was growing up. I ate a lot of beans as a kid. Pinto beans, navy beans. Uh, I, I still love beans. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I think, when Rebecca turned five, four years old. On her, her birthday, her fourth birthday, we asked her what she wanted to eat for her birthday. She wanted beans. And I ate a lot of beans as a kid. My grandmother, when she made beans, she uh, would sort the beans. How many have ever made, how many have never made beans before? Probably a lot of you never made dry beans. She'd sort the beans, and you sort them to get out all the rocks. Because you get a pebble the size of a bean, it'll fall down through the sorting bin. So you got to get the pebbles and rocks out of the beans. Then she'd rinse the beans, then she'd soak the beans overnight. Then she'd pour the water off the beans, then she'd put water, fresh water back on the beans. and It's a long process. Now you can take and put a little bit of baking soda in the beans. Miss Lois, you ever done that? Well, I'll tell you if you did, I'd tell my grandmother. Uh, you put baking soda in the beans, it speeds up the process. It breaks, it breaks down the inside of the outside of the bean, it makes them a bit mushy. My grandmother thought that was the worst thing in the world. Somebody did that was a horrible person. Uh, why, would you, why would you ruin good beans? Take the time and do it right. Every time I've done it, and I've done it a few times in my life, I think, man, I hope my grandma's not watching down from heaven. She's going to be mad at me, <laughs> so I'm trying to hurry up the beans. But we want to hurry up everything. We want to hurry up our Christian growth. 
And, and I don't think it's sinful to want that hurry. It's not sinful for us to desire, man, I want to be there now. It's like Paul said, I, I desire to be in heaven, but I know it's needful for me to be here. He had that desire. It's not wrong to have a desire to be what God wants us to be. We ought to have that desire, but we need to understand that it takes culti cult cultivating just like a garden, like a crop. It takes time. Uh, and we're going to look at some things here about this matter of growth and principles of growth. Uh, cultivating fruit or vegetables requires patience. My least plentiful virtue uh, requires patience, protection, and persistence. And as Christians, as we talk about our growth, we need those three things as well in our Christian life. Uh, we, we want that. We, we want growth. We want fruit. If you're a believer this morning, I hope that your desire is that your life would bear fruit to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I hope that our desire would be that we would be like Him, that we would want to, uh, to have that life that exemplifies Christianity. And most of us, though, we, we're like the bodybuilder that you know, doesn't want to take the time to build the muscle and goes and uh, uses illegal drugs and steroids trying to uh, boost uh, beyond normal that growth. We, we want that steroid boost as Christians. We, we want that superhuman uh, Christianity dose. But the Bible doesn't speak of that, but it does speak of some cultivating, some growing, uh, and we're going to talk about that. You know, over the last year, we've looked at real Christianity. We, we've looked uh, a lot of truth, a lot of points, and I, I hope it's been a big help to you. And I think by now that we understand that it is a relationship with Christ, that we understand that our walk with God is based upon His grace, just as our salvation is based upon His grace. And we see that it is that growth of relationship. Uh, real Christianity is a marathon. It's not a sprint. I told the story before, I think, my junior year of high school, our Christian school, we had a uh, small Christian school, not a tiny Christian school. We probably had, I don't know, 200 and some students in that Christian school. And we had a a big athletic program. We had a soccer program. We had a basketball program. We had a girls' volleyball program. Uh, very, very big sports program in our school. And they decided my junior year they were going to start track and field. And so they decided to do that. And there were two of us that signed up to be on the track and field team. Uh, my friend Jason Chang was track. And I was field. Uh, I would throw the shot put and discus, and my friend Jason would be the runner. That was it, our first year. Now, for us to get involved in the Christian school organization, to be a part of the, uh, the track and field meets, we had to participate in one event that year, and we had to participate in uh, one organized event, and we had to be in so many different things. So we went to that. Uh, my coach, Coach Burleson, and Jason Chang, uh, my good friend, and myself. Now, I was going to throw the shot put. I was going to throw the discus. That was all I was doing. Jason had to uh, run a couple of races. In the second race he ran, he pulled a hamstring. I've done that before. That is very, very painful. I pulled a hamstring on a teen activity about six or eight years ago, and I was hurting. It hurt really bad. Now, he pulled the hamstring before he had to run the mile. Coach Burleson came to me, and he said, Brian, he said, I need you to fill in for Jason. I said, what do you mean? He said, I need you to run the mile. I said, Coach, I can't run to the grocery store. Uh, I, I'm not a runner. I said, man, if something's chasing me, I'll turn and fight it. I'm not running away. <laughs> he, said, said, you, he said, I know you can't run. I know you're not a runner. He said, but we have to enter this part of the race uh, so next year our team can, can go to the events. 
I had to run a mile. Now, when I run a mile, everybody else is done. They get to go have supper. They get to come back, have some coffee, some dessert, waiting for me to finish the mile. I got last place. Imagine that. I think the whole thing was over by the time I was finished. I had to walk home because everybody already left. I, I, I'm not a runner. And if I was going to run, man, I, I'll be a sprinter. You put a cup of coffee 100 yards away, 100 meters away, and tell me if I get to that coffee first, I can have it. I might have a chance. But if i got to run farther than that, I'm in trouble. The Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It's until we see his face. And when we think of growth in the Christian life, let's not think of it as a firework. (laughs) Rather, it's like a marathon. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to go forward. Uh, He wants us to have that growth with intention. And get these two words, God wants us to have growth with intention and attention. We must pay attention and we must have the intention of growth. Uh, That's God's plan. As God works in you, and by the way, you don't work on you. As God works in you, as we yield to his work in us, God wants to cultivate fruit in your life. The fruit is his product. It's not yours. In the story of Cain and Abel, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought of the flock. Now, God commanded them to bring an animal of sacrifice. What did Cain do? Cain said, well, I'm a, I'm a farmer. I grew a pretty good crop. I'm going to show God how good I am. As he laid the crop out and said, God, check this out. I'm the best farmer in the world. Now, I'm also the only farmer in the world, but I'm the best farmer in the world, God. It wasn't Cain that grew those fruits and vegetables. It was God. Cain was simply the the husbandman. God's the one that gave the growth. There was nothing Cain did. Cain didn't go out and say, okay, grow pumpkin, grow, grow pumpkin, grow. No, it was God. What a picture of us trying to hold up our good works to God. It's not our work. And Christian, your good works, the fruit in your life is not your work. It's God's work of grace in my heart and in your heart. And God wants to produce and cultivate fruit. It's His work workmanship bible word there his workmanship the bible tells us uh the cultivation of our faith and god wants us to cultivate our faith that our faith grows uh, like that garden bring brings forth something evident something evident something real in the way of christ-like attitudes in the way of christ-like behaviors in the way of a christ-like lifestyle, uh, we will desire to obey His Word. And we'll obey not because we have to. We'll obey because we want to. That, that right there, that little hurdle, that obeying because we want to, not because we have to, that is growth in grace. That's growth in faith. Uh, that's growing in grace and walking with Christ. That How powerful that is. In other words, your faith, Christian, my faith is not merely an intangible. Now, we know the Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It says it is the evidence. It's not an intangible It is not something that is totally intangible. Rather, our faith, as it grows, changes us to the outside as we grow. When we left to go take Elizabeth to Bible college, as we're hauling all the uh, the luggage down, and 
We left the house and we left a, a little white dog at home. A couple of weeks later, we came back. Brother Darren came by and mowed our grass for me while I was gone. And he told me a few days before we came back, he said, Pastor, when I came to mow your grass, he said, when I reached over your fence, and by the way, my fence is this tall. He said, when I reached over the fence to open up the fence, he said, your dog was licking my fingers. Now I'll let you do the math there. He was licking this high. We came home, that little dog wasn't this little. That little dog was like Clifford, the big red dog, only he's white. And he, he did some growing. Uh, he, he had a growth spurt. We're praying it's over. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be looking for a farm. See if you can get me a saddle. Uh, Brother Hubert out there, you probably have access to a good saddle for us. Uh, we'll, need to, we'll need to saddle him, get him saddle broke. But he did some growing. Now, had we been at home during that growth spurt, we would have noticed the growth, but not as much as being away. Because we saw this, and a few weeks later, this. Now, Christian, a lot of times you say, man, I'm not growing. But understand growth in the Christian life is little by little by little. And God cultivates that growth by our faith. Our faith is not an intangible internal work. Faith isn't just invisible. Uh, faith actually shows forth. Uh, it is effectual. It is active. It causes growth. Uh, it produces visible transformation uh, and obedience to Christ. Belief produces behavior. Belief, true belief, produces behavior. James chapter 2, verse 18. You have printed there in your notes. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. This picture of faith, picture of works. And we're talking about growth, not growth to salvation. We've seen clearly and plainly over and over again in Scripture, salvation, uh, my eternal salvation received immediately. When I place my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I am kept by Him, not by my works. I don't earn salvation. I don't pay for salvation. There's nothing I can do. It's a transaction. He said on the cross, it's finished. But the Christian life, Christianity, we're talking about our daily walk, our daily life in Christ, is a growth of faith and works. Faith and works. Faith and works. Now, as we think about that, let's talk about God's work. How many of you remember Peter? Remember Peter, the man who said, I go fishing. Peter, the man who was outside watching. I mean, he followed afar off as he's warm in his hands there at the fire. Someone said, hey. I know you. Hey, yeah, you are with him. You're, you're also with him. Three times. The devil, the devil caused Peter to deny, to curse. Peter heard the cock crow. We have a Jesus denier. We have Peter, the man who said, forget this, I'm done. I quit. I give up. I know he said to follow him, but he's gone, and I'm going back fishing. Well, he's done. There's no hope for him, is there? No hope for Peter. I'm sure the Lord threw him away. You know, Peter is disposable. I used to drive a Ford Festiva. I called it my disposable car. I decided if it ever broke down, I was going to take the license plate off of it and leave it on the side of the road. It was a cheap piece of junk. It wasn't worth fixing. I drove that thing. 
Only thing I ever fixed on it, one day I was driving home from Bible college late one night, and it was dark, and it died on the side of the road, and I'm sitting in the car thinking, okay, I guess it's time for me to leave the car on the side of the road. I guess it's done. My disposable car, I'm going to dispose of it. And as I was thinking about that, I went to get out of the car, and I noticed a red glow come from under the vehicle. I looked under the vehicle. It was not the devil, in case you're wondering. Uh, I looked under the vehicle, and the catalytic converter was glowing cherry red. And it, all the honeycomb inside had melted and plugged the catalytic converter. Now, don't tell the state of Indiana, because this is probably very illegal. But I waited until it cooled down. I drove home. The next day, I took the catalytic converter off. I took a long 3 8 extension and a hammer. And I beat the honeycomb out of that catalytic converter. I turned it into a hollow pipe. I put it back on. That's the only thing I ever fixed on that car. If anything broke, I sold it to a buddy of mine. I said, man, I sold it to him cheap. as a piece of junk. You want it, you drive it till it dies. It's disposable. Just throw it away. A lot of us, we think that God looks at us like I looked at that car. God's done with me. He's going to toss me away. By the way, if we were God. We'd have looked at Peter and said, I'm done with you. You denied me. I want nothing to do with you now. But I praise God. I praise God that God wasn't done with Peter. That same Peter that denied the Lord, that same Peter that said, I'm not following anymore, I'm going fishing. Not many days after, would stand publicly and preach with the power of the Holy Ghost. And thousands, thousands would receive Christ. Now that wasn't Peter. That wasn't the fruit of Peter. That wasn't the work of Peter. That was the fruit of the Spirit in Peter's life. We see that God had a work for Peter. Shortly after Peter was reclaimed, by the way, in John 21, and we, we spent time looking at that as Jesus came and said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? What did Jesus say? Peter, I still got a job for you. Peter, I want you to feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Peter, I, I've got a purpose for you. I want you to feed my sheep. After Peter was reclaimed by Christ, we see that Peter preached on Pentecost. Peter was only the conduit. It was the Holy Spirit that did the work. Early in the book of John, the Gospel of John, we see that the disciples asked a very important question of Jesus. And Jesus gave them what we think is a strange answer. John chapter number 6, verse 28, I read for you quickly, says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do? What shall we do that we might work the works of God? That, that's, a, that's a good question. Hey, Jesus, we want to do God's work. How do we do it? What is God's work? That, that's a good question. And Jesus answered and said to them, I want you to listen to Jesus' answer, not religion's answer. Not a church's answer. Not, not culture's answer of what the work of God is, but Jesus' answer of God himself. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. That's pretty plain. He, he said, this is it. What is it? That ye believe. That ye believe on him who he has sent. What did Jesus say to the disciples, fellas? Let me tell you what the work of God is. Believe me. Have faith in me. The work of God is belief. The work of God is faith. That's what Jesus said. The disciples wanted to do God's work. But Jesus clearly says here, 
God's work is believing on me, fellas. That's the work of God. The beginning of all good work, the beginning of all good work for God is our dependence on Christ. Anything that I do without faith, God says it is sin. If I go back to Brother Dexter and I, I do something, try to do something nice for him, something good for him, God says, if I do that not in faith, it's sin. Now, that, that, that collides with our thinking because we don't have the mind of Christ, because we want to fit God in our little box. But God says that the work of God is belief. It is faith in Christ. And Christian, we will not grow spiritually. We will not go forward to what God wants us to. And God will not be able to cultivate the fruit in our life until we get to the point where we're willing simply to believe and have faith. I, I love the verse, Ephesians, those two verses in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of your works, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But Christian, can I tell you that Ephesians chapter 2 does not end with verse 9. Ephesians chapter 2 goes on to another verse that says that we are created. That you as a believer, that me as a Christian... That we together were created unto good works. God has a purpose. You know, if, if you're wondering, as we're talking about this cultivating, this growth, what, what's my purpose? What's, what's my job in all of this? Now, my job is to believe God. But, but what's my role? What, what's your role, Christian, when it comes to growth? Where does my effort come in? God's Word has to say a lot about good works, to which, by the way, God's called you. God created you. His work in you is designed to cultivate fruit. Good works flowing from you through His Spirit. His grace, God's grace, God's grace is meant not only to flow to you. And I praise God that I can be a recipient of God's grace. Amen. I'm sure glad that God wants to pour out His grace on me. But God doesn't just want me to be a sponge to be a recipient of God's grace. Christian, God wants to use you as a channel, as a vessel, as a conduit to flow His grace to others. And he does that as we grow in grace and as God produces fruit in our life, as God fulfills what he created you for, what he created me for. And we see that picture here in Scripture. Scripture is clear that God calls you, Christian, to a holy life. By the way, don't lie to yourself. Don't listen to the lie of the devil that says, Oh, I can live however I want. I can do whatever I want. God loves me. God forgives all. It's, it's okay. It's under the blood. I can just live like the devil. It's, it's all right. That's not God's plan for you. God wants you to live a life separated, consecrated unto him. God created us unto good works. God calls us to a holy life as well as a fruitful life. A fruitful life. Now get this statement and don't miss this. God calls you to good works, not for salvation, but as a product of salvation. Christian, can I tell you something shameful for us and shameful in Christianity today? Is that there are a lot of folks who are following a false gospel, who are hanging on to false religion, who are doing good works, trying to earn their way to heaven. And by the way, it'll never happen. The most quote-unquote religious person in this world that does the, the best in life, 
without the shed blood of Jesus Christ will spend eternity in hell. There's a name that many people, folks my age and older, know. A lady by the name Mother Teresa. Some of you know the name. By all accounts, a, a sweet woman. A wonderful woman that did many wonderful works. And I didn't know her. I, I had known nothing of her soul. But I can tell you this. That if that dear lady who did so many wonderful things never came to a place in her life that she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and trusted Him for salvation, she's in hell right now. So, Pastor, how can you say that? Because God says that every person without Christ has no hope. Now, we are saved not by our works, but God wants us because of our salvation we're created unto good works, not for salvation, but because we are saved as a product of our salvation. The natural result of genuine faith is a like Jesus lifestyle. By the way, that's why the early church, that, that's, why, that's why in Antioch, <coughs> they called the followers of Jesus Christians. It was not a, a sweet term. Now, I believe the early Christians liked the term because they were saying, man, you're all just a bunch of little Jesuses. You're just like Jesus. By the way, that, that was a hateful word coming from the lost world. But boy, what a compliment to a true Bible follower and Jesus follower. We are to be like Jesus. We are to be just like Christ. We're to follow Him. And we see that growth principle here. We're created unto good works. Good works don't earn salvation. And by the way, they don't earn favor with God. We've got to get away from that thinking that I'm going to have to earn God's favor. I've got to do something to make God happy. I have God's unmerited favor. God loves me because He decided to love me. By the way, when God decided to love you and God decided to love me, we weren't very lovable or lovely. But He decided to love us. I don't earn it. I, I don't get His favor by doing something for Him. I, I don't keep myself in God's grace. I don't keep myself in God's merit. But I am to glorify and to honor the one who gave himself for me. I'm to glorify him. A lifestyle that expresses my faith. Christian, a lifestyle that expresses your faith exalts the Savior. A lifestyle that expresses your true faith in Jesus Christ will lift up your Savior. It will be well-pleasing to God. The more you and I understand God's grace, and God's love, the more we're going to be motivated to yield to Christ, to yield to His Spirit. We can take a look at the many ways God says His grace will become visible in a growing lifestyle of good works and fruit. Look in Galatians 5. I think you have printed there in your, in your notes. Well, maybe not. I'll read for you quickly for sake of time here. Galatians 5, verse 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I'm going to read several verses to you quickly. You have this next one, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Philippians chapter 1. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Uh, you have this one as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, printed there in your notes. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God 
and our Father. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, excuse me, this is the one you have. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men, even as we do toward you. A couple more verses I'll read to you here quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Familiar passage, probably to most of you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Good works. Titus 2, verse 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of Good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke into love and to good works. I, I think maybe you might start to see a pattern here in Scripture. God's plan for us. The Bible tells us in James 2. Yea, you have this verse printed there in your notes right underneath the introduction. Yea, a man may say, they, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. First John chapter 3. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. How wonderful this morning. How wonderful this morning that God loves us that God shows us His grace, that God has a purpose for us. And Christian, God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for you day by day. God has a plan for us. All the verses I just read for you there indicate that growing faith takes time, takes attention. Like a garden, our faith needs to be cultivated. I can't produce growth. Christian, you, you can't will. I'm, I'm going to make I'm going to make myself grow. You can't do it. We can't will spiritual growth. But I can nurture my faith. You can nurture your faith in a healthy environment where growth can happen. You cannot manufacture fruit. Only God does that by his spirit. But you can cultivate the faith and the health that leads to God producing fruit in your life. And, and we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks about these principles of growth. I'll give you just a, a little bit here. Uh, probably not going to get to any of the notes yet, but I want to give you just a little more uh, introduction here. Uh, we're going to talk about quickly here before we close intention intention and attention intention and attention how many of you are married here how many how many married couples we have we have a married couple here that's getting ready to become a family of three here in how many days how many three that's what you think have you talked to the baby yet the baby has, uh, it's, you're not going to decide. Uh, but three days is due date. But several of you are married here. We have some folks, I believe you're the most newly married. Is that right? In, in the room right now, I think you're the most newly married. Who, who, who's the, the oldest married? I'm not, I'm not going to ask. I'll get myself in trouble, Miss Lois. But there, <laughs> some of you have been married a while. Brother Dries, how long have you been married now? Two years? How many of you lost money on that bet? How many of you thought it wouldn't last that long? Yeah, I lost a lot of money. Uh, I called Vegas, put a lot of money on it, and lost money. But many of you have been married for two, three, four, five, ten, twenty. How many years, Jim? Twenty-seven years. Either Jim got rid of all of Ruby's frying pans, or he has a really hard head. That's all I know. But twenty is a hard head. Twenty-seven years. Now, in a marriage, in a marriage relationship. Staying in love and staying close to your spouse does not happen by accident at all. It happens on purpose. How, 
how we, we make jokes about marriages and make jokes about marriage trouble, but can I tell you that to have the kind of marriage God wants you to have and that right relationship, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. It, it comes by intent and attention. You have to intend on having a good marriage. You have to give attention to that marriage. You have to intentionally cultivate, resolve, ha have conversation. You have to deliberately plan to focus on one another. And you can look around our culture today and find out that it's not, it doesn't happen by accident. That's why the divorce rates are through the roof. That's why so many people aren't even getting married because they know the, the biggest, so many uh, relationships are failing. So they don't even commit. And if they do commit, there's no commitment. Because it takes a lot of work. It's a relationship. You know, if you have a, a good relationship in a marriage and a spouse does something for the other spouse, one would hope in a right marriage relationship that if a spouse is doing something nice for the, the other partner, that it would be, you know, if you ask them the question, why, why did you do this for, this for your spouse, your husband, your wife? Well, you know, I, I don't want them to be mad at me. That's not the answer you'd want to hear. Well, you know, he, that's what he expects. That's what she expects. Now, that might be some honest answers, but that's not the answers that we ought to have. It ought to be, well, why would you do that? Because I love her. Why would you do that? But because I, I love him. Because I, I want to please him. Because I want to please her. I, I want to show my love. That, that's where a right marriage relationship, where that comes from. That, that's the foundation of that. You know, our love ought to compel us to show that love in a marriage relationship. That's the way God intended it. By the way, God's the one that designed marriage. God's the one that wrote the book. And God wants us to show our love. God wants our natural giving of love not to be a burden, but rather to be a delight. If we ever get to the point, Christian, where we're doing the Christian life because we have to and not because we want to, your relationship in Christ is in as much trouble as many marriages in our culture because we've gotten away from the right principle. God wants us to cultivate a right relationship, our relationship with God. And we're going to talk about, we've got a lot, several different things I'm going to give you here uh, in the next week. We're going to uh, look at uh, several different points about, I guess we're going to look at six different points about growth and how we can grow. But as we've seen, the Christian life becomes frustrating. It, it can become disappointing. It can become redundantly systematic. We can have some struggles. We can have faith that doesn't flow from love. Just as you can have a marriage relationship that is out of convenience. It's out of duty. God wants our relationship with Him to be a relationship of us on purpose with the intention of having a good relationship and with the attention of focusing on our relationship with Him, growing in our faith, believing Him, and letting Him flow that fruit through us. So the question is, as we close out here this morning, what are the healthy conditions for faith? What is the right way to cultivate growth? What can I do? What can you do in the way of attention and intention that will grow your faith? How can I do that? We could travel around the world and ask a bunch of Christians, successful Christians, how do we do that? We could find ways to grow our faith and get the roots of faith to grow. We're going we're to spend some time in the next couple of weeks 
looking at some points, and I believe the next couple of weeks are going to be so, so vital for you and for, for me as we grow together. And God wants us to grow. God wants you to grow. God wants your relationship with Him to be sweeter. God wants our opportunity to witness for Him to be a greater scope. God wants you to be able to glorify Him on a greater level. God created you to glorify Him. God created you to good works. And we're going to look in the next couple of weeks some points of how we can do that. And I, I trust that you'll be praying and asking God to, to, to shine the light of His Word in your heart. That you'll be willing to accept God's truth. And we're going to look at a lot of Scripture of how we can take those steps of growth together. Let's pray together this morning as we close. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to, to grow together. Thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word together. Thank you, Lord, for the time we can come together as a church family to worship you, to encourage one another, to, uh, to lift up Christ, to focus upon your word. And Lord, I pray you'd bless us as we do grow together. Lord, help us be with us next week as we continue this lesson. Lord, I pray you'd be with us in our service to come. Lord, I pray you'd be with those traveling yet to be here. And Lord, I pray that in every every uh, area of our service, you'd be glorified. Lord, I pray you'd be with our young people in our Sunday school. Uh, Lord, as they are uh, learning your word, Lord, I pray you'd bless them, be with my wife as she teaches them. Lord, I pray you'd be with the, the singing, Lord, as we sing and uh, praise your name, be with the preaching of your word, Lord, our fellowship, uh, Lord, that everything would glorify you. Lord, would you be glorified and honored. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be dismissed. We'll start our service here in about 15 minutes.